Practice Test 2, page 74, section 1. Summarize spoken text. You will hear a short lecture. Write a summary for a fellow student who was not present at the lecture. You should write 50 to 70 words. You will have 10 minutes to finish this task. Your response will be judged on the quality of your writing and on how well your response presents the key points presented in the lecture. Lecture A Now, Professor, recently you wrote a letter to a leading national newspaper complaining about falling standards in both written and spoken language among students, even graduates, and saying that you deplore the way English is being debased by change and dumbing down. Yes, I said that standards are falling and that very few graduates these days can write a comprehensible essay. Their grammar and syntax is all over the place. Um, and I do have certain regrets over the way some words have now become unusable in their full meaning because they've been sloppily misused by those who should know better, such as journalists. So because they use, say, enormity to mean something very big instead of something very wicked, I can no longer use the word in its correct sense without being misunderstood. And there are hundreds of other cases like this. But, of course, language changes and meanings shift and change emphasis, and it's as useless to complain about that as it is to moan about the weather. The point I was making was that, at the earliest possible level, children should be made familiar with the basics of grammar and syntax, how to put sentences together, and so on. But I'm not suggesting going back to the days when, as I did, you had to analyse sentences in minute detail, as if you were doing Latin. Though, of course, there is something to be said for having that kind of detailed understanding of the language. Lecture B Perhaps the first example of what could be called a newspaper was the Acta Diurna, roughly daily news, that Julius Caesar introduced in 59 BC. This was a handwritten news sheet posted daily in the Forum at Rome and in other common meeting places around the city. Of course, a lot of the news would be out of date in the sense that, for example, it took a long time for reports of a victory in a distant country to get back to Rome. Nonetheless, a lot of the items included are similar to those found in more modern newspapers. News of battles, as already mentioned, as well as political and military appointments, political events, and even a social diary recording marriages, births and deaths. One mustn't forget sport, if that is what you call it. Just like modern fans of football, sports-minded Romans could keep up with the latest results of the gladiator contests. People who lived in the provinces and wanted to be kept up to date would send scribes to Rome to copy the news and have them send it back by letter. Many of these scribes could make extra money by providing the news to more than one client. Quite a few of them were slaves and would go on to use the extra money earned to buy their freedom. Lecture C. As you have probably noticed, fashions and tastes change quite noticeably over the years, most obviously perhaps in clothes, hairstyles and popular music. The reputations of writers and artists are no different, though the alternating periods of being in and then out of fashion are longer. A part may no longer appeal to a large reading public for a number of reasons, though we must keep in mind that poetry is a minority taste and its readership is relatively small in the first place. So, um, I want to look at the reputation of Alexander Pope. In his own lifetime, he was praised and idolised by both his friends and the literary world in general, though he did have some rather vicious enemies. Yet both friends and enemies seemed more concerned with either praising or attacking his character and morals than with properly assessing the poems themselves. The Romantics, of course, had little time for him. Indeed, the Romantic movement, in poetry at least, was an attempt to make a complete break with the strict formality and rationality of the Augustan poets, of whom Pope was the most notable example. They did not regard him as a real poet, 
and complained of his ignorance of nature in the sense of mountains, trees and flowers. The Victorians were even less responsive to Pope, and this was probably the period when his reputation was at its lowest. In fact, it wasn't until the 1920s that Pope and the Augustan poets were re-evaluated and given the attention and respect they deserved. Practice Test 2, page 75, section 2. Multiple choice, choose multiple answers. Listen to the recording and answer the question by selecting all the correct responses. You will need to select more than one response. Recording A. It now seems likely that the earliest printing presses were, in fact, simply the common screw presses used for crushing oil seeds and herbs, or even for doing more domestic chores, such as pressing fabrics, adapted for printing. Other large wooden presses, such as those used for crushing the juice from olives and grapes, known as beam presses, had been around for centuries, but proved to be unsuitable for printing due to their size and their necessarily heavy pressure. Most presses of this type work on the simple principle of direct vertical pressure controlled by a central screw, at the lower end of which was attached a flat board, what later became known as a platen. We know that many of these earliest printing presses were still in regular use in the 17th century, and the basic design remained almost unchanged until the 19th century when they were replaced with iron presses. Recording B. Technological change has had a profound effect on the way music is made and how it sounds, as well as on the way we listen to it. New technologies, and I mean this in the broadest sense, not just electronic devices, can alter the sound of music and, in the case of electronic recording systems, affect the economics and distribution of music. For example, the innovation of the valve trumpet in the 19th century changed the sound of the orchestra. Now, everyone has easy access to a wide variety of music, but it is arguable whether this has increased our understanding of it. Before radio and recorded music, those who could afford it would have pianos or pianolas, mechanical pianos that played a role of sheet music, so the basic ability to read notes off a page was more widespread. However, these days, regardless of whether or not we are musical experts, there is no doubt that music enhances life, and with the internet, Sites to download music from, file sharing and so on, we have access to more music than ever before, and a lot of it for free. Recording C you may not know much, if anything, about Jean-Jacques Rousseau, but you have probably heard the well-known quote, Man is born free and everywhere he is in chains. In his early work, Rousseau argued that mankind was happiest and at its best in a state of nature, that is, before the creation of society and civilization. He saw society as artificial and corrupt, and that good people were corrupted by it. The Social Contract is perhaps the most enduring and well-known of his books, covering pretty well every aspect of man in society. However, in this book, his attitude to the condition of man in a state of nature changes. In such conditions, man is brutish and competitive by nature, and there is no law or morality. Therefore, because it is easier to survive by joining forces with others, people form societies to better fight anything that might endanger their situation. Rousseau's political philosophy has had a profound influence on later thinkers, even though, or perhaps especially because, it is open to many interpretations. But political philosophy is not everybody's cup of tea. In his own time, Rousseau was a bestseller, 
with novels such as The New Eloise and especially Emile, though even the latter is not free of his constant desire to improve society. It illustrates his ideas about the best form of education, which involves educating a child's emotions before their reason. This too had a profound influence on educational theorists. Practice Test 2, page 78, section 2. Fill in the blanks. You will hear a recording. Write the missing words in each blank. Recording A. Paper was first manufactured in Europe by the Spanish in the 12th century, although it had been imported since the 10th century. Around the year 1276, a mill was established at Fabriano in Italy. The town became a major centre for paper making and throughout the 14th century provided most of Europe with fine quality paper, which it has continued to produce ever since. By the 15th century, paper was also being manufactured in Germany and France, and it was not long before both countries became almost completely independent of material bought overseas. With the increasing availability of paper in Europe, the production of identical printed pictures became almost inevitable. Recording B. The spinal cord, the link between the brain and the body, is a band of nervous tissue about the thickness of your little finger that runs through the backbone. Nerve cells called motor neurons convey electric impulses that travel from the brain to the spinal cord, branching off at the appropriate point and passing to the various parts of the body. Similarly, Sensory neurons transmit messages from organs and tissues via the spinal cord to the brain. But the spinal cord also functions without the brain having to intervene. It alone controls those actions called spinal reflexes that need to be carried out very fast in response to danger. Recording C. The growth of the modern state brought with it the development of mass political parties and the emergence of professional politicians. A man whose occupation is the struggle for political power may go about it in two ways. First, a person who relies on their political activities to supply their main source of income is said to live off politics while a person who engages in full-time political activities, but who doesn't receive an income from it, is said to live for politics. Now, a political system in which recruitment to positions of power is filled by those who live for politics is necessarily drawn from a property-owning elite who are not usually entrepreneurs. However, this is not to imply that such politicians will necessarily pursue policies which are wholly biased towards the interests of the class they originate from. Practice Test 2, page 79, section 2. Highlight correct summary. You will hear a recording. Choose the paragraph that best relates to the recording. Recording A In his great novel, Remembrance of Things Past, or In Search of Lost Time, Marcel Proust explored what are called involuntary memories, those that come to us quite suddenly without conscious effort, usually triggered by one of the senses. The fact that his book has two titles in English might suggest there is some doubt as to how our minds go about remembering things. In perhaps the most well-known such episode in the novel, the character Marcel is reminded of his childhood by the aroma produced when dunking a cake in a cup of tea. 
This is not far away from the belief that as we get older, we can remember quite clearly incidents from years ago, but find it hard to remember what we did last week. Proust's insight into memory is certainly true of one way the mind works. But why and how do we remember what we do? Experts believe that we store memories in three ways. First, there is the sensory stage which is to do with perception and lasts only a fraction of a second, taking in sight, sound, touch and so on. These first perceptions and sensations are then stored in the short-term memory, which is the second stage. Finally, important information, or information that has been reinforced by, for example, repetition, is then filtered into the long-term memory. Naturally, we tend to more easily absorb material on things we already know something about, as this has more meaning for us and can create a web of connections with related material that is already stored in the long-term memory. Recording B I want to look now at the three main approaches historians have taken towards the English Revolution, or Civil War. There is a fourth point of view, taken up by most schoolchildren when they first meet the subject, but it can hardly be called historical. On the one hand, schoolchildren tend to have a romantic image of the Cavaliers, who were supporters of the monarchy, as aristocratic, charming, flashily dressed and up for a bit of fun. On the other hand, they tend to regard the Roundheads or Puritans, who were followers of Oliver Cromwell, as miserable, working class, dressed in black and insisting on a life without luxuries. It isn't difficult then to take sides. The first approach, which prevailed up until the middle of the 20th century, was that the revolution was part of the age-old battle between Parliament and the monarchy, with Parliament representing the traditional rights of Englishmen against the attempt by the royal family to increase its power and dictate law. In reaction to this, the second approach saw it as a working-class revolution and an important stage in the development of capitalism. In other words, they saw it as a class war and a forerunner of the French Revolution and those that came after. Historians who supported the third approach saw that things weren't as clear-cut as the others thought. Instead of seeing the revolution as the result of long-term trends in the country's history and therefore almost unavoidable, they focused on the details of the period immediately leading up to its outbreak and allowed for its unpredictability. The two sides also weren't so clear-cut, with some aristocrats supporting Parliament and some members of the working class fighting on the side of the monarchy. Practice Test 2, page 80, section 2. Multiple choice, choose single answer. Listen to the recording and answer the multiple choice question by selecting the correct response. Only one response is correct. Recording A. How would you define reasonable as it is used in law? For example, you are allowed to use reasonable force when defending yourself. It seems to depend on how serious the situation was, whether it was possible to resolve it by peaceful means, whether you were ready to try those means, and, finally, the relative strengths of those involved. Now, most men know, and they've probably grasped this from their earliest years in the school playground, that when it comes to blows, Fights don't stop until one of you is in no shape to do any damage to the other. The criteria mentioned seem a bit fuzzy to me. 
How can you convince a jury you were ready to try and talk your way out of it when the other person would have none of it? And besides, he was quick to land the first punch. Also, you can strike the first blow and still plead self defence. Of course, you again have the problem of convincing people that the threat was so great that you had no alternative apart from getting beaten up yourself. Reacting calmly and rationally to a perceived threat is not easy to do. Recording B Randall Jarrell, the great American critic and poet, once defined the novel as an extended piece of prose fiction with something wrong with it. Now, nothing is perfect, and you don't have to look very hard to find something wrong, or perhaps just something you don't like, about any work of fiction you care to name. Where, we might ask, does the editor come into this? And is it beneficial to an author to have an editor who is also a novelist? You would think that being a writer themselves, familiar with the process of writing a novel and its demands, they would be able to get inside the head of the author and be sympathetic and understanding of what needs to be done. This is not an unreasonable assumption to make. However, is it not possible that there is an opposite side to this? Editors might, from their experience as writers, possibly unconsciously try to make over the submitted novel as they themselves would have written it. The ideal, one supposes, is for the editor to see the book through the author's eyes, but if they apply their own creative talent to the job, they might end up seeing it too much through their own eyes and, in this way, take no account of the author's original intentions. Recording C It is claimed by neuroscientists, among others, that speaking two or more languages increases cognitive abilities and in some way rewires the brain, as it were, in a way that positively affects how the brain works. And it's true that we tend to think of people who can speak two or more languages as being bright. Learning a language is, anyway, good mental exercise not to mention its benefits in introducing you to other peoples and cultures. This is why all school curricula should include at least one compulsory foreign language. Anyone who knows two languages will find that, in certain circumstances, they compete for position, the vocabulary of one getting in the way of the other. Often, bi or multilingual people find one language more suitable for expressing certain kinds of thoughts or feelings. There is another view on being bilingual, not from a neuroscientist, but from someone whose business involves words and language. Brought up in a bilingual home, speaking Greek and French, and also fluent in English, she is old enough to remember when her native language, Greek, was also, in effect, two languages. There was the formal, correct form, Katharevousa, which was taught and spoken in schools, written in newspapers and books, and so on, and the everyday, demotic language you used with your friends. As for her view on bilingualism, she says that you end up with a split personality. Practice Test 2, page 81. Section 2. Select Missing Word. You will hear a recording about photography. At the end of the recording, the last word or group of words has been replaced by a beep. Select the correct option to complete the recording. Recording A These days, nearly everyone with a mobile phone is able to take photographs or even make a video. But originally, cameras were so large and heavy that photography's appeal as a pastime was limited to a few enthusiasts. Also, the time needed for the exposure meant that your subjects, if you were photographing people, had to remain still for what must have seemed like a very long time. 
movement would come out as a blur in the picture, or if someone walked across the view of the lens, would not register at all. Which is why early photographs of city streets appear deserted. In other words, all pictures had to be posed. However, as early as the 1880s, manufacturers in both Europe and America began producing miniature models. Some of them small enough to be hidden in people's clothing. Cameras came in all shapes and sizes. Handbags, walking stick handles, and tie pins were among the oddest, and were collectively known as detective cameras. This was not because they were used in police work, but because the user could move about without attracting attention. You will hear a recording about career aspirations. At the end of the recording, the last word or group of words has been replaced by a beep. Select the correct option to complete the recording. Recording B. Most, if not all, young men and women have dreams of the future, which include themselves, their families, and possibly their country. At one time or another, they evaluate and criticize their own society, and think of the changes they would like to make. For most people, however, the biggest contribution they can make to their society's development and change is through the careers they will follow, rather than through direct political action. For the lucky few, their careers will be interesting. As well as allowing them to make a measurable contribution to the growth of their country, this is why it is important to know something about the career aspirations of young people and the reasons for their interest in these ideal careers. At the same time, it is equally important to consider whether their aspirations are. Practice Test Two, Page Eighty Four, Section Two. Highlight incorrect words. You will hear a recording. Below is a transcription of the recording. Some words in the transcription differ from what the speaker said. As you listen, circle the words that are different. Recording A. In the nineteenth century, few people could afford to travel abroad. It was expensive, and there weren't the mass transport systems that we have today. So curiosity about foreign lands had to be satisfied through books and drawings. With the advent of photography, a whole new dimension of reality became available. Publishers were not slow to realize that here was a large new market of people hungry for travel photography. And they soon had photographers out shooting the best-known European cities, as well as more exotic places further away. People bought the pictures by the millions, and magic lantern shows were presented in schools and lecture halls. Most popular of all, however, was the stereoscopic picture, which presented three-dimensional views and was considered a marvel of Victorian technology. Recording B. Classified advertisements placed by individuals in newspapers and magazines are not covered by the Advertising Standards Authority's Code of Practice. If you happen to buy goods that have been wrongly described in such an advertisement and have lost money as a result, the only thing you can do is bring a case against the person who placed the advertisement for misrepresentation or for breach of contract. In this case, you would use the small claims procedure, which is a relatively cheap way to sue for the recovery of a debt. If you want to pursue a claim, you should take into account whether the person you are suing will be able to pay damages should any be awarded. Dishonest traders are aware of this, 
and often pose as private sellers to exploit the legal loopholes that exist. That is, they may claim they are not in a position to pay damages. Practice Test 2, page 84, section 2. Write from dictation. You will hear some sentences. Write each sentence exactly as you hear it. Write as much of each sentence as you can. You will hear each sentence only once. Like humans, owls can see in three dimensions. Modern art now does better than stocks as an investment. Commercial necessity was the reason given for the decision. Grants are available to those in financial difficulty.